Welcome back to another episode of a podcast written by a software engineer. Um, I'm absolutely lucky today. I've got an amazing guest. Carlos, welcome to the show. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I know, especially with your busy schedule nowadays, uh, you have so many interesting stuff happening. You're an entrepreneur, you're a software engineer. You got so many, uh, I guess, different projects going on. And uh, definitely today, I think it's the best opportunity to dive straight into it. But, you know, for the people who don't know you, what do you do? What have you been doing? Tell us more about that. Well, um, yeah, thank you for the kind words. Um, so I, I guess that I am a software engineer. That's actually what I do for a living. And, but what I really enjoy doing is like building my own businesses and trying to build like side projects and uh, that kind of thing. And that's actually my goal is actually building my own kind of business and, and maybe hiring more engineers in the future. That's so cool because um, everybody hears about the Cinderella stories where by the time you hear about it, they're like worth billions of dollars and nobody really sees this like beginning phases, like this initial phase where you got to make decisions. It's like a, everything you got to test out and see if the market fit is there. So we're definitely going to dive into that and see, I guess, your perspective on how to tackle these problems. Yeah, that'd be nice. Um, but yeah, let's go back a bit. Um, so how I would describe you is, Carlos, you're probably one of the most ingenious engineer I know out there. Um, in terms uh, of being technically savvy and just like looking at a problem and like, I guess, tackling it, implementing it. But a lot of people who don't know about this is that you didn't have a background in computer science or software, engin- software engineering. In university, if I'm not mistaken, you did electrical engineering? Yeah, it was well, electronic engineering, which is well, similar, probably a similar category. Yeah. But yeah, that's the, uh, so I did not study computer science. That was, um, it's kind of, it's tricky to say it because I'm not sure if it was a good thing or a bad thing. Um, in a way, like I learned a lot of things that I that were very useful. Like I, especially for example, I learned a lot of maths and like I learned a lot of like low level like programming and low, I learned a bit of like C and do a lot of assembly code and that kind of thing. But I never actually got into like high level programming languages like I don't know, like JavaScript or, and which is kind of the most useful language that you can actually learn at the moment um, yeah that's uh, that's actually a really good point because when you said you learned all these um I guess uh, more classic programming languages Java C and all that was that part of your curriculum or was that something that you did on the side well I mean I we did we did have a few courses on C and assembly concretely those were those were the ones that we learned okay they were but part it, of your program and everything. yeah but not not much like we, Honestly, the, we didn't get very deep into them, um, but I definitely didn't learn any like high level language like Java or like JavaScript or any web at all. Like that, that is something that uh, I totally like learn on my on the side. And I remember specifically one summer that um, it probably was um, yeah many years ago, but I remember that summer and I, I did buy a book on web programming and web development. And I started learning all the like HTML and you know just like CSS and JavaScript, and I was like, I, my initial goal is trying to like learn that so I could make my own social network. That was a that was a thing back in the day. Now, uh, yeah, probably I will, that will, that's probably the last thing I will try to build. But yeah, at that time I thought that I would build my own social network, and uh, which it was uh, definitely an interesting project to get started with, and I learned a lot of things. Yeah, and when you're talking about like thinking about these ideas, or whatever, that's not the first like big idea that actually became a thing nowadays. We're gonna dive into it maybe later. Is that uh, you, I remember you told me that you built a quadcopter back then when drones weren't like a standard thing. So for the people who don't know what the quadcopter is, basically the modern day drone. And this yeah. we're talking about at least what like maybe ten years ago, where you had the idea of yeah, doing it and you did that. Too. So this but, is kind of, I guess like for me the kind of character that you are is basically. You'll have all these ideas of trying to build the first social network, trying to build a quadcopter, and like this was before everything, any of those was a standard. So that's just, if people don't know you, that's probably the best way to describe you. Is that you always think about these kind of stuff years ahead of everybody. Um, the other thing that I do want to point out from what you're mentioning in terms of electrical engineering, my background, I did a, I did computer science in university, and surprisingly, the web aspect of software engineering is so light, even in the computer science programs. We did loads of like Java, PHP. C, we didn't even really touch C++. So like during the whole curriculum, it was like databases and all that. How do you feel about this imbalance, I guess? Nowadays, it's 2019. How do you feel about all this focus on, I guess, building more socket apps as opposed to web apps or mobile apps in a university degree? 
um, I think I think it's pretty tricky because on one side, um, learning all, all those things is pretty is really really interesting is really useful like especially i would i would put special attention to like data structures and algorithms those are like two big things that are, it's important to learn and i think i think it's very very useful if you know them um so on the other hand like learning a, a specific apis like could be like java or like learning that language that if you are never going to use Java in the future, that may not be the most useful language to learn or may not be actually a useful useful skill in, to have. So it's tricky because I think one of the the thing the problems in the, of the university is that like professors they learn their thing a few many years ago. So it happens that the web community and the computer science community it, it actually advances very quickly. So it can happen that a professor that learned some like like whatever like subject like ten years ago now they are teaching something that is totally deprecated and like people are not using anymore. So the industry moved moved forward, but we didn't move forward with the teaching or the education. And I think that at least that's a specific that's a real problem in Spain. I'm not sure other countries, but I do have that problem in Spain. And um, so yeah, I think that it is best to focus on the on the basic materials that could be like data structures or and um, algorithms and or yeah. databases for example databases so of point. course that's that's a big thing but it's like learning a specific language that you can learn that in the future you, you don't need to learn php you don't need to learn like like java that you can focus on other languages and and that may change because now it's javascript but who knows like maybe in like 10 years it was going to be something else so it's kind of like pointless to like pay so much attention to one specific language. That's very true. Um, just because the way I thought about it was that I feel like when I was in uni, uh, when you were talking about like you went out of your way to get books to read about web programming and all that kind of stuff, for me it was exactly the same. I remember during, I mean, how I got my first job was definitely I got a job in web development. And they, when I was mentioning that, they didn't really have loads of web development in the actual course load. I had to learn all that myself, like learning Node.js on my own, learning all of that using being able to use frameworks. But I think without having the basis of, I guess, understanding what a function is, understanding how a class is and all that, it would be much harder to be able to do that on your own time. So I do understand yeah, why, of course. I guess, like computer science degrees, they'll focus on the theory, but then like it really takes you on your own time to, if you want to explore it, you got to do that. Um, the one thing that I'm interested in is that you studied at a university in Spain um, in electrical engineering. And you did mention that there was like all these computer classes or like these computer topics that you get to do. How does the language barrier work? So were your textbooks in like Spanish or were they in, in English? Like I, like I guess the logistics behind it, not the actual content of what you were learning. Well, um, that's um, it's, a, it's a funny one because I think the specific knowledge and technical knowledge is mostly in English. Now, um, we do have the textbooks in Spanish. Now the problem is that some of the like terminology is actually in English, and it is actually a funny thing now because I, I did work with many Spanish engineers in like lately, and it, it is pretty tricky because I do know the terminology in English because I honestly have never worked in Spain, so I I do not do not know the Spanish terminology for some of these words, but they may have a different word for. I don't know, like so, some algorithm or some like data structure, and they have a specific like name for that and and I would not know that so and it is a, a, it's a bit of a tricky one like the like internationalization of technical knowledge so I mean because I think about this all the time so yeah because when you're going into school they I mean the instructor will be saying all of it in Spanish so like this recursion they probably have a different word in yeah, Spanish exactly. for recursion I, I'm, I keep on thinking about this because people in like Asia and China and all that they do program as well. So how does it work? They're like I'll, they'll be talking to each other in like Mandarin or Chinese or Cantonese or. But whatever. they will still write the code in English, right? Yeah, writing JavaScript is still going to be var or const or I whatever guess. it is, and like so it's just yeah. these like language barrier, literally of like the human language. They did try at some point in the past. Like there, there were different different languages that they tried to to inter to localize the language itself. But I think that becomes even more tricky because. If you are trying to read the code of some like a like French company, and then it happens a lot. For example, I do I do know of some people that they worked on projects that they were 
written in languages that were localized, and specifically it was localized to French. And it's funny because you get code that is actually written in a, in, for example, like basic, and they, they're written in basic, but they're written in basic in some other language. And that becomes actually a, a challenge because like you have to overcome, you need to learn the language. And sometimes it's like, I don't know, it's just like, doesn't really make sense to, it's, it's tricky. I think that eventually the, the community kind of figured out that it, it's not really a good idea to localize the language. So it's better to have like an international, it's just code is written in English, full stop. Yeah. And it's easier to read. Then projects can move countries. They can go from France, they can go to Spain, or they can go somewhere else. And that's, that's not a problem because because everyone is written in, has written the code in English, but... Yeah, as in like, I I mean, I never really thought about it, how we take it for granted that if my piece of code, I give it to anybody, I guess, across the world, if it's written in like JavaScript or Python, everybody is able to pick it up and like read what's going on with it. And I don't know who made that decision, but hey, thank thank you to the people who standardized it and made sure that my code that I write... Yeah, I just hope somebody. that it doesn't change. Because, yeah. you know, yeah, lately, there are so many people that are trying to like get very... Yeah, kind of like they just want to like promote their, their language and trying to, so it might, it might, they might have the idea of like potentially like localizing and, and translating the actual language. And I don't know. Yeah. I mean, one of the fun projects that I've seen is that people would try to make human language into a programming language. So they'd be able to be like, um, loop over this uh, array like six times. And then like, just because you're able to write that English sentence, it'll generate some code and then they'll take that and be able to do it. But like, that's like, just some crazy side projects. I don't think it's ever gonna be a standard when it does happen. Yeah, I think the problem with that kind of approach is that it's just very general and people can, like there are so many ways of doing the same thing. So um, I think that like programming is just a subgroup of logic. So it's like that there is a specific group of things that we chose that they were part of the language, and that's actually and that's the basic like logic stru uh, structures that you can have. And if you start adding like if you just translate human logic into programming, you can you can end up with like weird like so many different strange ways of like maybe doing loops, uh, which are not necessarily needed. Like you just yeah. need one way of doing it. There's like there's a level of like low lower level that you need, and when you get to that point, you don't really need any lower level or higher yeah. level than that. Um, oh, we definitely have to talk about your web summit project later as well because yeah, we right. do loads of that. That'll be fun. But yeah, let's go back to when. Um, so basically, you had an engineering electric engineering degree by the time you graduated university. Um, how did the next step happen? What did you do as the next step? How did this whole pathway of becoming? Yeah, that's a funny one. Um, so I did I did a study in Spain, but then I moved to Ireland. To the Republic of Ireland and then uh, so I lived there for a year and I, that's, that's when I actually learned to program properly let's say and and I did learn a lot of uh, web development and I started I did some courses on like Ruby and at that time like Ruby on Rails was becoming like quite popular so I did learn Ruby on Rails specifically specifically I did learn a bit of Python as well and Django and then I, yeah, um, eventually I moved back, well, I moved to France and to Luxembourg and I ended up working for in the fintech industry um, as a Ruby developer and that's actually how I got started in web development. Um, that's, yeah. that's pretty cool because that's always the hardest step. Like I know a lot of people like in, well, back then in that situation, but also nowadays when you're basically finishing up university and like, how do you make the jump from one to the other? So um, when you went to Ireland, did somebody already have something to offer you or did you just blindly jump in there or how did that transition? Um, I had a friend actually in Ireland and this guy, this guy didn't know Ruby and Rails. And so we did, I don't know, he, he showed me around and like he got kind of like explained me how, they, how it worked. And I started at that time, actually, I, I had a flatmate. Um, and this guy, so we, we kind of decided that we wanted to do a project together. And we started working on, it was kind of like, a, again, another like social network. And it was like a social network for Erasmus students. Uh, Erasmus is kind of like a program that uh, like Europeans, they do when you are studying, like you can go to a different country when you are. If, oh, like they, studying they, abroad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that program is called Erasmus. So um, I was part of that program. And then we decided to make some kind of like a social network, like a community where people could like share their whatever experience and 
And that's actually, that was the project that we started working on and we did it with PHP and Codeigniter. And that was, uh, I don't know, that was challenging, but I, I actually took care of mostly of the front end because I didn't know that much of a uh, backend at that time. And so, but eventually I actually learned like Ruby on Rails and we started moving into that kind of direction. Okay. Was that a was that an actual job or was it just a side project? No, it's just like a side project. I, he was my flatmate and we were doing it on uh, like free time, let's say. Oh, that's so funny because I actually had kind of the same thing when I, during uni when I was, well, I wasn't flatmate because um, I was living at home during uni. I was in Montreal. Uh, but I remember during the summer, I would always try to find like a couple people to start like a project on the side. So one of them was like, oh, I wanted to build like a calendar builder that could fit into other people's websites so for example if you're a you're a dentist and like i could be like i got this software that you put on your website that people could book directly appointments on it worked that during the summer don't know where the project went <laughs> i think it's still like pending at the moment you still but, have the code for that yeah it's probably on my like, github somewhere it's definitely it's definitely hidden up there but i think it's like i think the similarity of i guess how we think about these paths is that like you should be doing that even though you don't get paid at the end during the summer yeah. you should think about these projects that you want to work on just because it's so beneficial on top of the material that you learn at school. So I think I think from that point then, like when was the first time you got like a full time job for engineering? When was the time when somebody trusted you and be like, so, um, I want you to build this stuff? I think the first job that you get is actually tricky to get always. It's actually quite of a challenge. And I did have a bit of a trouble because I moved to France and I did not speak French. When I crazy but and that, that was a, that was a bit of an yeah it was an interesting period of my life and i spent like six months looking for a job in france and but i didn't speak any french and that was a that was, that was a big challenge because i thought that people would accept english speakers but that that's not really the thing in the in at least in the area where i was living and so yeah i end up actually working in luxembourg so i found a job there but i spent literally like six months applying all over the place to so many places and that was quite challenging and especially when you don't have a, a kind of a software engineering background trying to convince someone that you can do software is actually it's, it's tricky and but eventually you get your first job and once you have your first job it everything just flows and it just moves for, moves forward and it just becomes very easy yeah i mean shout out to everybody who's doing software engineering nowadays who doesn't have like a computer science or like a software engineering background because being you definitely have to convince people to be like i know how to do this i know i got you definitely have the skill sets but just being able to translate it and yeah uh, tell people because i know i mean i do know a handful of people who has a physics background a uh math background a i guess like by bi biology background that do end up doing data i mean software engineering nowadays so shout out to all the people for that and then when you're saying that you have to apply so many places my logic well my my advice is if you haven't applied like over 100 200 applications you i don't think you've applied enough is that is that reasonable yeah. nowadays think about it yeah my, my trick I, I always said that um i i try to convince everyone when i find someone that is unemployed and is looking for a job and and they cannot find a job i always like tell them this kind of like rule of thumb for me that the rule of thumb is applying every day five times if you apply if you send five cvs five resumes every single day after a year, you have applied more than 1,500 times. It's literally impossible that you don't find a job. With the probability is really high that you will actually find a job if, if you apply 1,000 times. The odds, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just really, really likely that you are going to find a job or at least you're going to have a few interviews. So when someone tells me that they cannot really find a job, most of the time it's because they didn't apply enough times. And um, it is tricky and people, uh, you know, it's, it's challenging and it's frustrating, but at the same time, I think it's possible and you just need the first, the first plunge, you need to, you just need to go, go yeah. for it. And I really do think that somebody has to say that. Somebody has to say it because you never, not never, you never, like for me, kind of rules that you rarely get the first job that you apply to. As in, I don't think I can relate to anybody who applied to one job and got it right away. I've, everybody I've spoken to. Um, has gone through a lot of interviews, a lot of processes, exactly. and then that's when they got it. Uh, we're definitely going to dive into like how, I guess, your perspective of how interviews work in a bit. But um, I want to bring it back to the point where, um, so what was this first job that you had? What was the first time where nine to five you were doing software engineering? Yeah, so um, um, yeah, it was 
mostly Ruby on Rails, and uh, it was a very old application. We, ha we were migrating things over to a different application, but it, it was really like a massive fintech application that it just uh, it was very difficult to work on that specific application because anything you could you touch would break something else, okay. and it became like a very. Uh, but it was an interesting experience at the same time because. I think it's important to have that perspective of what is working on a legacy on legacy code and on software that can actually break and and if you break it, plus we have like legal issues, so you cannot really break it and that creates a whole process behind it and how to release becomes very complicated and it's just like you need to give 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 a head like tell your clients that you're gonna put update something and. It just becomes uh, quite of a challenge, and it was interesting, definitely working on that side. But uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is good that um, I guess even before getting into it, did you have an idea of that? You one of your responsibilities was to migrate older legacy code into newer code, or was it when you got into it? Nah, uh, you don't get that. Like, <laughs> that <that's, laughs> who tells you that? <laughs> no one tells you that you're gonna maintain a legacy application. That that. That's actually like shooting themselves on the feet. Yeah, for the people, were, yeah, for the people like different. going into a new job, definitely ask that. I feel like that's a great interview question. In terms but I of think like... in your first job is is very difficult because you you never worked at a company, so it is you need to know what is working on a le on legacy projects and what is working on legacy code. It's just because that's part of the job. It's like, yeah, you can't run away from it. Exactly, and it's important to have that experience because I think. That yeah, it's just uh, very important to have. Even even if it's frustrating, and most most of us, we actually like working on, on new code, yeah, new feature, green, all that stuff. Exactly, greenfield is always better than brownfield, and it's always better better than totally legacy. Yes, yeah. but I think one of one of the um for the people who don't know the term of the Boy Scout rule, I think that's one thing that uh, I heard quite often in the past couple of years, which kind of goes. With the mindset is that if you're going to be touching code, no matter where, it always should be cleaner than it was before you you got there. Yeah, so the idea is that like if you're gonna go camping, if you're gonna be at a spot, like by the time you leave it, that place has to be cleaner than it was. And I didn't realize the importance of it until you start seeing the actual effects of legacy code and every time you touch stuff. So that's one of the rules that I swear by nowadays. Mm. The Boy Scout rule. I'm definitely swearing by it at that point. So. Um, that's really interesting to see your first, I guess, your first real-time job. Because when I got into my first, like, real full-time job, it's kind of the same idea where you jump in there. You don't know what you can do, and you don't know what is to be done at that point. Like, when you see the... But yeah, exactly. You, you don't understand business. You don't understand what is yeah. what is actually being an engineer. What are you doing there? Like, wh why do they hire you? Why do they pay you? Like, you need to understand exactly, like, what is the need. And the need is, in my opinion, like, what we do is just automate things. Like, we fix and automate things. That's, that's literally our job. It's like building tools and building things that can automate other people's job in a way. Yeah. And there are pieces of work that, for example, in this company I was working for, um, one of the big like tasks that we have to do is creating some documents. And those documents, they need to be filed to a specific um, yeah, organizations that they are taking care of that fintech regulation. So um, we had to file all these documents, but there were so many of them. It's like thousands or sometimes like it could be like many 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 documents and so if you want to do them by hand you need like an army of 100 people to do it but the beauty of code and that's actually where the need comes is that you can actually create a software that can do that for for and basically you are doing the job of 100 people and but you are just automating that and that's actually where the the whole need comes in and they hire you and they pay you for that and you need to understand that's actually the need and it's difficult to set, to get that impression because when you are studying, you have that perspective of this is your like theory and you are learning your education and that's fine, but that you don't really understand why business is business and why yeah the, the the use cases like the actual like this is the input of what you got which is thousands of documents and the output is so that they mat like they end up where they need to be. But at the same time, I think what the important point that you're pointing out there is that you really got to like think before you do a challenge, as in like think smart before you waste time tackling the problem. Because if your solution was to like, I guess, hire more people, that wouldn't be the exact solution as opposed to like writing a script that could automate all these, I guess, decoding of the files and sending it to different people. So that is such a great point to point out because I remember in uni when we studying all the theory, like relational databases, like all the stuff. Yeah. 
it's so tough to get like a real life example of why you're doing this. If you know what I mean, like yeah, you don't, you don't get it. And I think the the, the in the initial the beginning of the problem is actually that professors, many of them, don't get it either because they never worked on that on that. Field. Not never. They, Not they never. haven't worked that much. Yeah. It's a hard word to say. <laughs> but many many of them, like at least in Spain, like people go the education route and they they became they become like professors and yeah. they keep like studying like a phd and then they move po- like post phd and they they move on that field and then they do they teach and they start doing that but basically yeah. they never really had that big experience on the the professional side yeah. and maybe in different countries it's, diff- it's totally different like i think in the in the u.s specifically i think it's different than, than in spain but in spain it, it can happen that you have teachers that they have very little experience in the private sector. And that's actually what you're most likely going to do. So it is... It, it is a, it's a big dilemma. I mean, for the people who didn't know, um, professors in university, their main role is not to teach. Their main role is doing research. And the side, I guess, role that they have to do is also teach to other people. So I didn't realize that until I graduated uni after uni that somebody told me that, like, oh, that makes sense. That's why they have all these, like, TAs and... All these other people like yeah. kind of maintaining classes because their main focus when they're part of a university is to actually do research. And I'm pretty sure I could say this for most people, for most professors, that they love doing research, but teaching is always like a 50-50, I guess, in terms of yeah. if, if you ask them what you want to do for the next eight hours, I'm pretty sure if they have the choice, they'll be like, I just want to do research at that point. So yeah, of course, that yeah. is an interesting thing. And Which is it totally, it's totally cool. It's just that it's not aligned with what, what most people are going to be doing. After uni. Yeah, because I mean, I think what drives me every day in, in, I guess, software engineering is that like you're presented with a problem that you have to think about and whatever you put out there, whether it be an interface or whether it be some script that you write, the result has to be significantly impactful at the end of the day. And that's how businesses work. If it's not an impactful feature or ticket that you're working on, then what's the point? Um, I like when you're talking about working in fintech. Um, you know, <laughs> you know how you you can't round numbers in fintech. You can't you can't like floor numbers. You can't do all that because then you're gonna have digits missing and all of it. Yeah. Um. How important was that? As in, you probably did you have like test coverages back then or? Yeah, we did have a lot of test coverage, and we had a really high test coverage, and we did have a lot of end to end tests specifically because we especially it was a big a big trouble meeting the deadlines and um, the problem is that sometimes like you get these documents and uh, you have to file um, maybe i don't know a specific day and there's an hour where you need to actually file them and so you need to ensure that the code or your application is going to work at that time and it's not going to cause troubles because that that actually creates problems for people and and your clients can can literally sue you for that and that becomes a, a bit of a trouble so um, yeah, it, it is important to to keep a big coverage and ensure that the application is actually working. So um, yeah, we had a lot of automated tests and, and we also had the QAs and people that were going through and ensuring that the application is actually properly functioning whenever whenever it's needed. Nice. As in, I think this is more for people getting into a I guess a job or choosing a job. Like definitely make sure that the sector you're getting into, you know exactly what kind of responsibilities you get. Because, for example, if you if you work in a slightly lighter non fintech and just building interfaces and having more A/B tests and the impact of one decision is less likely to getting sued at the end of the day, that's something that you should definitely consider when you, I guess, get a new job at that point. Um, but yeah, that was really cool because after that, you um, so you worked in Luxembourg in a bit, and then uh, you moved to the UK after, which is where I met you at Hirespace. Yeah. Um, how was that? How was the jump? I guess obviously from moving one country to another. And I guess your role over there was slightly different in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, being able to look over other engineers a bit more. And then how, how did that whole like transition happen? Yeah, that, that's an interesting one because I, yeah, I, I did. The thing is that London was considered, at least in, to my eyes, and I think that it was a common like feeling. Like at that time, it was considered like the tech hub in Europe. So everyone in Europe wanted to come to London, and so I thought. You know, I just had that in my mind, and and uh, at some point I was like, "What am I doing in Luxembourg? I should be in London. That's actually the place where I have to be." And so yeah, I just decided to come to London, and I found a job. Uh, actually, I found a job totally remotely, which was was a funny one because I it's the first and only time I've done that, like finding a job. I, I interviewed all remotely, and that 
Well, I did actually come. I did come at some point to, to London. But yeah, I, eventually it was uh, pretty easy because I, I, I came to London already with a job, which was a, a good opportunity. And yeah, so, um, so that's where, where I met you at uh, Space. So I got this kind of like land management responsibilities there, which I remember was a bit challenging because my, my English was still kind of like, yeah, a bit rough. And <laughs> so uh, it's no, probably you were, perfectly, still, you were perfectly fine. Like we all did the same. We just messed around with you saying like, what, what? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the, yeah. Well, th- I think the biggest trouble for me was actually understanding people. Not really, not necessarily that they understood me, but just like I had troubles yeah. understanding an English accent. For the people who think that everybody in the UK speaks like the UK TV shows, it's not true. <laughs> like, yeah, it's not because you can so, understand people on a TV show from the UK that you can understand people living here. Sorry to disappoint. Um, <laughs> but that is a that is a really cool thing because when you're talking about uh, all these remote interviews and like you don't even need to set foot into the country before actually being secured with the job. One of the great things is that obviously it'll be a lot more peaceful by the time you come in here so that you're, you know, you know you have an objective and you don't have to run around doing yeah. all that. And the other thing is that as time gets more and more modern, I think for the people getting interviews nowadays, um, there's nothing stopping you from getting interview across the world. So, I mean, if you're located in, in Europe and you get an interview in the US remotely, it's definitely something that happens nowadays. And um, yeah. the idea of the, well, I guess, can you just give us a brief like, overview of how does, I guess, a modern interview process look like in tech for like a software engineering role? Well, um, I did actually have some interviewing experience. So I, I, when I worked at HomeAway, I was so HomeAway is part of the Expedia brand. And I, I did actually spend some time interviewing people. I, I probably interviewed, like, yeah, many, many, yeah, many people actually, many software engineers. And so the process, how it looks like is usually, so you get one, a few like screening interviews first. So you usually you get like a phone call and that initial phone call is usually like just like cultural fit. So basically ensuring that you are actually a good fit for the company and that you, yeah, basically that they are like your, your objectives and the company's objectives, they kind of align. And once you pass that screening interview, then you get to a technical interview at least a a first screening interview and we did ask like a few like random technical questions just to ensure that you are not lying about the fact that you are an engineer and you have a specific experience so mostly questions like i don't know did you ever work at an agile team how did that go i don't know how what is i don't know what is a function literally (laughs) just like very very simple random questions but just to ensure that you are actually a software, software engineer and that you can do the you can continue the process and then uh, once that works then we usually invite you over to an interview if you are on site so if you are in london we would invite you to the interview otherwise we would do like a remote call and we will go through multiple interview processes like it depends like sometimes the process can be harder so you can get multiple interviews on that on site so you could have like three or four interviews and on the, on the same day, usually that we do that because you want to separate different aspects of the job. So sometimes you have like a system design, you have architecture on one side, you have like so actual software engineering or maybe like a pairing exercise. And so you get this different and eventually you get one like HR sort of thing. Yeah, like that kind of cultural. Yeah, I mean, values and everything. Yeah, that that, that that so. Um, and then after that, if everything goes successfully, that's when the offer goes out and then sees exactly. how, you, how you bounce back. So I guess in a very broad picture, I think it's a quite similar mold for a lot of different companies, not only just in Europe, but I think around the world as well, because the first bit, the phone technical screening, when they're asking you questions in terms of um, what have you been doing for the past couple of years, and then the second second call, I guess, in terms of whether it be uh, they give you like a really brief technical question, maybe one question in an hour to see if you could figure it out, that's... It yeah. usually happen during the second step. And then the thir- third step is usually when they try to get you on site where you get multiple interviews, uh, just touching different aspects of, of, I guess, a real day life yeah. as a software engineer. So I think that kind of mold is what most people should be expecting when they... Yeah, I did forget actually one, one part of the interview process, which is actually very important, is that we usually send a challenge. So we will have like this cultural fit interview for on screening, then we have like a small technical interview and then we send you a challenge. Mm-hmm. And then once you complete that challenge, then we review it. And then that's when the decision actually happens on 
whether you pass to the on-site interview or not. Um, yeah, that's the usually does. Yeah, and I like even from my experience, from all I've seen, like that, uh, even that step of after the first phone call and between the I guess the on-site and the second and the first phone call, that phase. Uh, the, there's usually two methods I've seen. One of them is either the people sends you a test that you could take home to do it, or another one is that you schedule a call with one of the engineers that work there, and then for a whole yeah. hour you could share your screen if you're, yeah, I guess, uh, different, exactly. and then you could do that. But um, yeah, which is always an interesting process because um, some people think it's lengthy, some people think it takes so long in between. But at the same time, it really reflects on how accurate the day-to-day life is at the end of the day. So. Um, we could definitely talk more into that because yeah. uh, we're going to get into Homeway in a bit. But at Hard Space, though, so that was kind of the first experience where um, it, the project itself was really fun in terms of you have to build loads of stuff to make sure that the the system works, the internal tools work, but also the front end, uh, the customer facing. But we could talk about the bit where, in terms of just giving advices to other engineers out there, how did you approach it in terms of what did you know what to, I guess, tell somebody? And how did you know that what you're telling somebody is... Um, good advice as opposed to just like I don't know I, I guess I guess I don't know <laughs> I just I just you know, to be honest from that answer that means that like the answer that you were giving is because you deep down knew like you didn't question it in terms of like how true they are because you knew conceptually that they were good advices so like when you say you don't know it's because you probably never noticed it and like you never really questioned if they were true or well, not well I guess, I guess the, my, the way I usually behave is just I try to be honest and I try to be helpful and I try to give like proper constructive feedback so and that's what i try to do that sometimes i may be accurate sometimes i may be totally wrong but that's at least is my approach yeah and even from my point of view as in like you did line that line manage me for a good amount of time there from my point of view it's kind of the same thing where it's like everything you've said was always for the better of the people for the company and all that but there was never a moment where i didn't um as in, like, I didn't feel like I couldn't challenge what you were saying. Everything that you said, I could have challenged it. But most of the time, it's something that, like, I, I guess made a lot of sense. And there was another moment where I was like, that's completely stupid. <laughs> so, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But, I mean, that's, I guess that's really good advice for anybody just, like, I guess, working with younger people is that when you try to give advice, you just got to believe in what you say. You, like, don't doubt yourself because, like, at that point, that's when all the doubts come in. But... From what I've seen when I was working with you, that's basically how I felt at that point. So. Well, I mean, you, you can definitely doubt yourself. Like that, sometimes you you may be t- t- totally wrong. Like you can give a bad advice. Like sometimes it happens. Like you you have an, a specific idea and you are wrong about it. So it's important to be also flexible about what you think. And sometimes like you have that, that's the problem of being dogmatic versus like being pragmatic. And um, so being being dogmatic about anything, like it could be coding, it could be whatever in life like basically and i think it's not good like you should you should not be dogmatic you should be pragmatic you should be you should apply your concepts and what you know and try to solve the problem and if you don't solve the problem like it it might be because you are just being dogmatic about what you think it's just like maybe you are obsessed of for example you want to use javascript for something and maybe the best tool to use is like python so just don't be like very hard on your decision because it may be that you are actually wrong and so you never know when you are going to be wrong and because usually you think you're right yeah and that's actually the problem i think what was interesting as well is that like i think throughout this whole cast so far that we didn't really mention any specific languages that we do because for i guess for the people going into i guess into a real first job is that a lot of times they'll focus on like i want this to be my first language i want that to be first language but after I guess a couple of years looking at it, is that you don't need to have chosen a language? As in you every, can, you can change. I mean, life I, changes like a hundred percent, and you change. And it's totally, it's, it's very simple to change, especially like languages and that the barrier of entry from one language to another is not that high. Like it's literally just spending a few, I don't know, a few weeks yeah. learning about it, and you're done. You're and fine. I think from your point of view of inter- interviewing people, you never really tell them that like you have to know this language. No, I think a lot of not. times the whole screening, the whole process that you were mentioning, is to see how somebody thinks. Not it doesn't matter what tools they use. It's just see how they think, how to approach a problem, and then learning how like a hammer works at the end of the day is definitely not as much work as un- like as learning how uh, I guess how you implement an algorithm or design yeah. a system at that point. So. Um, and I think what's interesting is that uh, you had your job in Luxembourg and then you moved to London. Uh, the whole scene is slightly different, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, the higher space is a startup environment. So everything is a lot more like 
you know, young, we had a pool table and all that kind of stuff. That was really nice. Yeah, so that was different than your first job, I'm guessing. So the first yeah, job it's didn't... totally different. Uh, on, on my first job, I was actually wearing a suit, and it was this, I don't know, this very corporate environment. We had like all these pieces of art around us, and like some very fancy people were coming to visit the offices, and yeah, it became we had like some policies that were interesting at least. I, um, for example, there was this policy where we had to wear a pink shirt once a week. And it was like, <laughs> no, it's just, yeah, yeah, and it's like a, it's a very random one, but it, it is actually part of the, like the dress policy. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a different kind of environment than going to a startup. Yeah. You flip London, the switch basically, right? you know, it's yeah, just it's totally different, but, uh, but I, it, both are enjoyable. Actually, I, I came, I came to the realization that I actually enjoy wearing a suit, which is, it's a funny you miss thing. It. Right? You miss I, it sort bit. of, because when you spend multiple years doing that, like, it's not that, you know, you, you find the advantages of doing that, and it's it's it's, it's not it's interesting. Actually. Yeah, that's so that's so cool because um, I mean, I can't recall another person, another deaf person that I know that wears a suit to work every day. So I wouldn't mind it if I end up getting like in a job. Actually, it's surprisingly comfortable. Like if you wear a suit every day, it becomes like a uniform. So you yeah. literally you have. You don't need to think, what am I going to wear today? Like, Well, that's what happens same. with, like, for example, like Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, always yeah. wearing the same thing. It's not a suit, but it's just because they don't have to think about it. Yeah, exactly. It, it so. reduces the cognitive effort that you need to put. Yeah. But that, so like, that was kind of like the difference where you're doing that and then you got to a startup in London. And then uh, your next project that you worked on was Home Away, which a, I guess is a subsidiary of Expedia. So Expedia is massive in terms of booking flights, booking hotels. Yeah. And then one of their subdivisions is called Home Away, which is responsible for booking accommodations. Like, um, yeah. it's kind of, I'll say it's like an Airbnb similar competitor. Yeah, it's a similar competitor to, uh, it's, it's a competitor of Airbnb. I think it's a different, a slightly different business model because they are trying to get more like families and it's mostly like longer like durations. So you don't stay for one or two days. It's literally you are staying for a bit longer, like a week or two weeks, and it's usually like a, a proper house, and it's like a vacation house. Okay. And you go to a, like a beach house, and you get the full house for you. So and yeah, it's, um, but it's still it's, it's part of the the travel, the whole travel. Yeah, the whole uh, brand of uh, Expedia. And I mean, it does make sense because I mean, like if you talk about all the accommodation and stuff, but. So t- yeah, let let us know what you came in as, as in, like when you joined the team and everything. What what did they? What were your responsibilities? Was the setting kind of like a startup setting as well? Like what did that look like? Yeah, it, it is. Uh, I think it's a kind of like the typical. I think it's yeah difficult to say because it's like most of the tech tech startups they have the same kind of things. So you get all these like pool tables and you get like food and startup, like startup yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a different thing, by the way, to what I had in Luxembourg, because it's a totally different environment, right? So, um, but it's interesting. So, you still, you get the table, the, we had PlayStations and things like that. I don't know, the environment was really cool. Like, uh, all agile teams, we had a, we were actually working in the 26th floor of a building in, very close to Victoria, in the center of London. That was amazing. Like the views were incredible from that place. I mean, you saw the backyard of the Buckingham Palace. So yeah, I knew that's about insane. that. I, that's insane. I actually saw the Queen once. It's like <laughs> the, you can see the Queen like hanging out in her yard. That's really cool. And so yeah, that, that's uh, that was a really interesting environment to work in. And I did have the opportunity to go to the U.S. and all the, like multiple times. And the offices in the U.S. are are the same. They, they specifically have they have big offices in Austin, Texas, and they were like really like just really really cool offices and really cool people. Like very 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 good engineers working there. So yeah, yeah. so that's interesting. Did, did did they get you to go there to I guess learn from other engineers in that office? Like why why why, why were you out there for with the company? I guess so. Um, I went there. Mostly, I would say just business. Like there are there are meetings that you people you need to meet and yeah, things that you need projects that you need to move forward and eventually I think it's good to meet people in person because you are talking to them on Slack and you are talking to them yeah. like by email or something and and you know you get these impressions and like somehow like you judge people just by what you see on Slack 
And then what you don't know is that there is actually a person behind that has a life and has yeah for sure. And it's really I think it's really valuable to like meet these people in person. And you're also reading their code as well, as in like exactly. you're reading people's code that you probably never met, and then um, that's one of the things. So I guess the the actual role itself, or like the job itself at Home Away, was a lot of just building more systems, building more, designing them as well, and implementing, uh, I guess, a web stack. Okay. Yeah. So we were working at um, the, so the division. It was called. It's like marketing, a part part of marketing. So specifically, we were, we were building programmatic marketing. So we were doing a lot of landing pages, but in an automated way. So landing pages, for example, if you were to to look for, um, I don't know, vacation rentals, London, mm -hmm. and then you will find some like a landing page that is indexed and is literally tailored to you. So it will be like a landing page for males, I don't know, like 30 years old. And like it, it's got like features specifically just for you with pictures related to you and things like that. That's kind of the goal of what we were doing. And all of that is automated. And Yeah, from, from the user's perspective, perspective, you don't notice any of it. You just yeah. see all this stuff being displayed. So if you think that you're not being tracked when you browse the internet, think again. You're 100% tracked most of the time. Well, but it can be a good thing actually, because you get experiences that are really tailored to you. And mm -hmm. so your experience with some of these tools, if it's done responsibly and it's done with a good intention, it can be better. You yeah. literally are getting better experiences. Shout out to, to Balin, actually. He said the kind of same similar concept. Oh, really? And it's, I think it's a shared, I mean, when you think about people thinking about a product and think about the user experience, that's a very shared common thought. And I mean, you just putting it out right now is because you kind of think about the same way at that point. So that was really cool. And then when you were talking about when you're working that, did you, did you also have the experience of it? I guess you mentioned that you had the opportunity to also interview people and I guess also mentoring other people while you yeah. were going there. So there were there were multiple. So I was one of the senior developers there and there were some junior developers. So part of my role was actually like mentoring them and working with them. And then I, I did actually work. I did actually interview a lot of people there. And that was actually an interesting opportunity it was specifically we were ramping up in Madrid so I did interview a lot of uh, Spanish candidates in Spanish yeah in, in <laughs> Spanish that which is it was interesting because like I, I was actually supposed to do it in English but sometimes like yeah. we were switch, we would switch to, to Spanish it's a slip up which yeah <laughs> exactly it can happen but it is interesting because what I said before like I I know the terminology in English so they would say something in Spanish and I would not understand what they mean because I just don't know the technical terminology in Spanish. Yeah. Um, did, that, did that help engaging them if they're like qualified or not? Like just being able to... Probably, probably. Like that's, that's, it's, it's kind of, that's actually the challenge of interviewing. Interviewing someone is very challenging and it's very difficult to know if that person is actually good or not. Uh, or if it's not even good because good is not necessarily a good word for that. Yeah. Like it, it's just like... You, you need to know if that person is going to be able to do the job or not. And that is not necessarily easy. And even if you make like technical interviews and you happen to ask some guy like very technical things and that person like passes all the interview and is super good at that. And you eventually think this guy is amazing. He's going to do a crazy good job. And then he happens to be like super lazy, for example. And then... What do you do about that? The guy basically is very technically capable, but is not going to do the job. So it's just like why well, interviewing yeah. is totally broken. It's super difficult to interview someone and be like sure that that person is actually going to to fit. Drink every time you know some per somebody like that. <laughs> Drink every time you know somebody who's super gifted, but then like at some point a little bit lazy. It, it at that is, point. Yeah, it's just it, it's just very difficult to know. Um, yeah, and obviously from your position, you've definitely seen all the range. You saw people that, that could be the opposite. Somebody yeah. who might not be as technically gifted, but they're probably the most ingenious in terms of hardworking and being that. So exactly. that's why with this process, is you, it's so tough to nail every single yeah. trait of somebody at that so point. So what I definitely learned on that with the experience, interviewing so many people, is that some well, many times I was actually wrong. Like I actually gave a red flag to someone and eventually that person, like, I don't know, we we came to the conclusion that the person could do the job and then the person got in the, the company and then I actually totally regret giving a giving a, a red flag. So I was wrong about my, my perception. 
But then uh, the thing is, so what you learn is that you candidates can be rejected for all sorts of reasons. Like yeah, there are true. so many random reasons why someone could be rejected. So you, that should not discourage you. Like if you, and that's actually the reason why you need to apply so many times to different companies because. You might apply to some company and you will be like super sure that you're gonna do a crazy good job at that place, but then I don't know they just reject you and you are like what why did why did they do it? But that's the thing is that there there is no there are so many weird reasons like it can be that the manager is on holidays and it's just like it's on holidays and they don't want to hold you on the line and just like keep you waiting and they just reject you for that reason and it's just super random but. It can be one of the reasons why yeah. they reject you. And there are so many recent reasons why people could get rejected. So you just need to keep doing it and keep applying to different yeah. places. Yeah, I cannot put any more emphasis on the last point where you say you just have to keep on trying. Because for the people who are going all these through these processes, they're like, why? Why did I do it? Like, a lot of times you don't know why. And then if it's out of your control, it's not because you're not capable of doing it. There's just some other factor that of just happened. Not. And then, I mean, definitely don't beat yourself up for it. Don't let that stop you from... I mean, give yourself credit. Give yourself credit because you're going through the whole process and when you do get to the point, you're definitely going to be uh, justifying who you are at that point. So, so good to hear from you because you've definitely been on that position to be, I guess, looking back and looking at it. And it is frustrating because sometimes you actually find everyone thinks that some candidate is really good, but then some person is saying, no, this, this guy didn't give me a good feeling. And you're like, why didn't he give you a good feeling? I'm totally sure that that guy is really, really crazy good. And yeah, I don't know, that, it's just like, eventually one of the one of the guys that is interviewing didn't, I don't know, like that yeah. per, like the person for whatever reason. It, it may be that he had the same name that someone yeah. that he didn't like. God knows. I mean, His so, ex's name at that yeah, point. Yeah, it, it can be something like that. Like, so we don't know. We are humans yeah. and we are all like, emotional about things. And yeah. so... It's just like you do not you don't have all the variables under control. So because of that, it's frustrating. But some some candidates are actually right. rejected. And w- it's- whether I mean whether it be an interviewing process for a software engineering job, or I guess going on a date with somebody that you don't know about, or pitching to a VC fund and everything, yeah, it's, it's all the same context. The same. Where anything could I mean anything could go wrong. Whether it's because the other person doesn't like your hair or whatever it yeah, is, exactly. or the VC just finds like a little niggle and they're like, no, we're not gonna put money into it. It's the same idea that it's not always you that's completely fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> it's always just the context sometimes. Um, but that's great. Um, the other point that is really fun that I want to talk about is after working at Home Away, you uh, became a contractor. So yeah. in the software engineering world, it's quite uh, it's quite a topic that's uh, that people love to talk about in terms of the the two sides is you could be a full time employee with a contract that uh, you know have all the vacation days, uh, yeah. salary, and all that. Or you could be a contractor, which is yeah. you're more independent. Uh, you work by, I guess, most of the time, shorter contracts. Um, yeah, like from from your point of view, in terms of you could you could definitely give me a better explanation of what being a contractor is and yeah, how so, you went from one to the other. Yeah, I guess the um, for me, I think, and for many software engineers, is that doing working in this on the same project for a long time becomes very tiring and becomes very frustrating. And so I like working on projects for like a year, maybe. But after that, somehow like I need to move on. And my, my body actually asked me to move on to a different project. And sometimes it's not that possible because if you are working for a company, it's kind of like you have this commitment that you're going to stay yeah, with like them. Yeah, like full time, right? Full time, that's exactly what I'm saying, full time. So you, you probably are going to stay there for a long time. And they expect you to be working on whatever project that they have. And if projects usually last more than a year. So they, they are expected to be there for like five years or something. And so um, it, for me, it's just very difficult to like commit to working on the same project for five years. And that's a personal decision. I just, mm-hmm. so I don't mind coming to a project one once when the project is one year old or when the project is three year old. But what I don't want is to be working there five years. So being a contractor is really interesting because what they, they hire you at a specific times that they need to get more people on board and they need more, more like horsepower. They just need to get more engineers to, to work on the project. So it might be when the, the project might be like five years old, but they just need more people now. Yeah, and now for a period exactly. of time to... Because maybe they are hiring more people. It's usually that that's the case, is that they are hiring other people and they just hire more contractors this time to just to 
to ramp up. And then uh, once once the project is like done or when once you are your contract is yeah. over, basically. Yeah, literally, you have like like a sorted contract. Maybe they hire you for like six months, and they hire you for for a year. And to me, that's actually the crazy. That's the best thing, actually, is that you are moving forward, like moving to different projects often, and that is actually liberating to me. And yeah, it, the downside is that you need to be changing jobs every like six months. Or yeah, every year. we can talk about the pros and cons actually. So. Um, I guess you you have a quite in depth perspective from your point of view. I think the general picture that people talk about contractor versus full time. I guess one of the things that people talk about is daily rates. Contractor yeah. generally charge a daily rate, um, and most of the time you will notice that contractors have in the big picture a higher salary than a full time employee. And um, but when we talk about the downsides, the one thing that I did notice is that for a contractor, if you don't work uh, all the time. Um, you don't actually get paid on the days that you don't work. So in terms yeah, of perfect. holidays and everything, it's a different structure. So full-time employees, you're guaranteed a couple of holidays throughout the year that you take. But as a contractor, you don't have, I guess. Um, no, you you pay you pay for your holidays. You pay for your days off. If you need time off, you just you need to account for that. And also, you need to account for the time that you are not you are not in in a contract. So it, it can happen that you you between contracts. I don't know, you don't find the contract that fits you and that can take a bit longer. So you need to account for that as well. Mm -hmm. So you definitely have a higher salary. Let's say, call it salary, it's not really you. Yeah, yeah. you have like higher income in income. a year, I guess. Yeah, but at the same time, you need to account for all these things. And you also have insurance and other things. But anyway, I don't want yeah. to... I don't want We're to not like, going to dive into the details yeah, of, of that. But in terms of like being still. more independent, that's definitely like the difference. Is that full-time employees, you don't have to be as independent and managing your own like extra... Yeah, exactly. Like you, you basically have less headaches if you are a full-time employee. You just need to go there. That's the only thing you need to ensure, that you show up there and do the job. Yeah. While if you are a contractor, you have other things to care about. And usually you have agencies, so there yeah, are like let's, some. Yeah, let's talk about of... different ways of tackling it. So you just mentioned agency and everything. So I guess from your uh, from your experience of that, you ended up joining an agency that ends up sourcing a contract for you. Yeah. How that works. So um, So I offer my services to, so I have my own, like, so you usually get your own limited company. So you have mm -hmm. my own limited company, and then my company is kind of contracting, so offering services to that agency. Okay, so there's that, a middle agency called One yeah. One Ways in Between. Yeah. Which it, it was a bit even crazier because I actually was working for a different agency before. But like, so my company, I work personally for my own company. My company is contracting or offering services to another company that is called Tech Systems. Then Tech System is actually selling my services to 101 Ways. Okay. And 101 Ways was actually selling my services to a different to the final client, which and, uh, which is where I actually work. Right. So literally, <laughs> they were like three companies and I was working for the final client but there was the like three middle men yeah that's the life uh, of a contractor <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's a life and the business of like the contracting exactly. and software engineering so which is the kind it's the kind of thing that you, you don't see as a full-time employee because you are just going to work for one company yeah. and you are engaged with that company and they kind of care for you and they they put you they put you on a salary, they, they give you all these, like, I don't know, whatever, like, pension schemes or things that, that they have. While as a contractor, you need to look after yourself. Like, that's, yeah, for that's sure. something that your own company has to provide you as a personal, uh, yeah. Let's let's talk about what you actually do then. So, like, you're still a software engineer and everything, but now you work for, uh, well, you're the end client of that contract is a company called Dazen yep. or Dazone, however they want to call it. And uh, you're still contracted as a software engineer. So in terms of like building systems and everything, is the, like, I guess the day-to-day -day life as back when you had a full-time job as opposed to a contractor, how does that look like? Is it still quite similar? Where I think you... it's the same, honestly. It's, it's, very, it's very similar. I guess that there is one major difference is that as a, as a full-time employee, you get more, you have to deal with a bit more of like the internal politics to call so, it in a way. Like in a way, like you need to, you are part of a family. Mm -hmm. So you're part of a company and you need to like like look after the company. So you need to attend all these like all hands and ensure that you are going like you you know what the strategy of the company is because you're expected to you're expected to be there for the long term. Yeah, for the future so, outcome of exactly. it. Exactly. So you are included in all these conversations. But as a contractor you are not included in all those conversations because you are not part of the company. You are just offering a service. It's like if you are planning to 
I don't know, remodel your house, are you going to tell that to your plumber? Like your plumber doesn't necessarily know, need to know all this information. How many rooms are in the house or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Like, if, you are yeah, if you're planning on doing something with, in, with your family, yeah. your plumber is not going to know that. If, if you were to have someone else like live, your, with, your, you live with you, then that person needs to be included in all those conversations. But that's, the, that's kind of the thing. Is that as a contractor is just offering limited services. So there is a, a scoped job. While as a full-time employee, you not, you're not necessarily a scope. Yeah, the business objectives, you've got to be much more hands-on in terms of like, I guess, the values, OKRs, and like yeah, the exactly. metrics. You're definitely going to be more involved in that as opposed to now when you yeah. do the contract thing. As a contractor, what you do is you, you kind of follow them. So mm -hmm. if they give you values, that's part of the job. It's like giving you, like following whatever like values that the company has and like all, like just following the, the decisions that all they took for you. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, for the people who don't know what Dazen is, um, can you just give a, a really brief explanation? Yeah, so and also, like, what you've built there, I guess? What kind of fun little projects you got to build? All right, that's good. Uh, so, I, so Dazen is kind of like Netflix, but for sports. Yeah. Um, it's a really interesting company, and they are, like, I don't know, I just got growing like crazy. It's really, really, really interesting to be there. And there's loads of competitors. Like Amazon is trying to get into the sports streaming business. Yeah. You have uh, Facebook doing it. You have Twitter doing it. You have obviously all the TV channels like yeah, Sky, BT, ESPN definitely. doing it. So it doesn't sit in this ecosystem of streaming. I think it's a big market and, it, and they're all trying to get get a bit of that market. Of course, yeah, it's and, massive. Yeah, but in terms exactly. of what kind of what kind of but, projects are they so asking you to build, I guess? like well, what's Yeah, so it? I had multiple. That, that's one of the interesting things as being, being a contractor is that I moved teams a lot there so i moved i worked there for like three different teams three or four different teams and so i work in so many different projects so i worked and now i'm working in devops so i'm mostly like doing like setup of like aws accounts and like okay. like setting up like i don't know kubernetes or you know, things like that i'm looking after like some applications that we like to maintain the accounts and to maintain like services and so we basically offered a platform for the other engineers that are working at dozen and then I, I worked as well at the help section. So kind of when you go like help uh, look for the customer service and all that. So we build uh, another version of that project. And that's actually one of the projects I work for. Then, uh, I don't know, we, we, we built one that was really interesting. It's like a linter. So it's linting all the code that actually anyone writes. And whenever someone submits some code to, uh, the, the, to Git, then we actually analyze the code yeah. and then we check if there's some like security issues on that. And it's kind of like a static analysis, but we do a lot of like, yeah, like reg access to find if someone actually oh, that's committed. that's so cool. It's like a compiler, basically. It's kind yeah, of like a But it's so processor. cool because we build it with like serverless and it's just like running all the code of, like running through the code of everyone yeah. and checking that you didn't put any secrets or something on that. Yeah. So <laughs> it increases security and it, it was a really interesting and fun project. It's a challenge as well. Yeah, like you know, And for people who don't code, this is like... You're never gonna. It's not a front end thing. It's not a user interface thing. You're never gonna see this kind of stuff. It's basically for engineers out there. Yeah. It's just another layer of security, making your for people who don't know what the linter is to begin with. It's basically this program that you can put your code in, and then it will kind of clean up uh, your code a bit in terms of uh, adding indents, uh, putting yeah. colons, and also you can have it, special it will, rules on top yeah. of it. Yeah. It so, will basically tell you what is wrong with your code. Like somehow, like yeah. analyze your code and tell you, oh, there is. Uh, you shouldn't be doing this, or you exactly. should be doing that. It's a layer of, uh, uh, most modern IDEs have a layer of linting in there, so that's yeah. basically, but you, what was great about your project is that you were part of a team that had to implement it, which is even more interesting at that point. Yeah. So you really did touch everything across the stack in uh, in Dazen, but um, I definitely want to dive into another project that you've got going on, and it's called WiserTag. And yeah. um, you are the founder of it, you're an entrepreneur, in terms of you were able to get I mean, the ball rolling on it. This is always the hardest bit, and I definitely want to guess like your point of view in terms of how did you start with nothing? Because obviously, there was a point where you just didn't have a project to begin with. So, tell us, um, tell us what I guess Wiser Tag is. What is the state of it today? And then uh, we're gonna dive in between like you know point zero and point today, which is yeah, totally. Um, so, <laughs> so Wiser Tag, kind of the mission that we have is trying to connect people. Um, no, not to connect people. Uh, I don't even know the mission of my company. <laughs> uh, so uh, the the mission is actually connecting things with people. 
So the way we achieve that is by using like QR codes and NFC. So for example, the one project that we are selling at the moment and it's kind of like going all right, and it's a kind of a plant tag. So when you buy a plant, they use like an indoors plant, they will come with a small like label and that label is like filled with bamboo and has like a, this QR code. And then when you scan the QR code, it brings you to a page and that page has like all the plant care details and it has like like a lot of information. Like the name of the plant to begin yeah, with. The name of the plant, that's actually very important. And many people buy plants and you have your plant at home and you don't even know the name of the plant. So if you want to look for the plant care, like you don't even know the name of the plant. Yeah. Like that's, is, so it basically has all this information and, and it's all in one, it's just scanning that QR code and gives you all this information. So in a way you are kind of connecting that plant to your to the person that the owner that lives and, with it the yeah. person that lives with the plant and that's it's just a very simple project but it's kind of like a showcase project and they but the end goal is actually building more experiences like that like maybe like you buy a book and then on your book there would be like this qr code you scan it and then you get to a community for example you get to a forum and you get to you basically expand the features yeah uh, that some something that the book cannot do the book with the paper Ma like material you cannot really access to that and so you you need to extend that in a digital fashion so you need to build like systems behind it to to handle all, all of those features i think the best term to, to be using at the moment is internet of things yeah that's the thing is that internet of things is a very interesting terminology but the problem is that it kind of implies that you have internet and that you have you know, basically, oh, wait, to have do, internet. Do you not need it for the QR code and everything? The problem is that if you want to have internet, you need to be connected. So that item needs to be connected to the internet. True. So it needs to have circuit, circuit behind. It should, it should have like batteries. It should have yeah. like all these electronics to handle that. But at the and moment, your labels, none of it. That's the thing. So there's an intermediate step and it's called the connected things. So connected things is just for example, if you add a, a QR code to your plant or to your whatever project, and that item actually can, you can extend features and you can give extra information or extra features through that label. Yeah. And, and in a way, it's kind of like middle between connected, like the actual normal thing and Internet of Things. So it's just like a middle, um, like market. Yeah. And it does make sense because when we're talking about scalability, you don't have to reprint a tag every single time just because you could update the data or the information directly exactly. on the information. And realistically, it's better for the environment because yeah, you don't have to waste all of it. So <laughs> that is a really cool thing in terms of um, the project itself. So what is the state of it today? So I'm guessing, can we? How do we get it? Is it so, available or? So um, at the moment, uh, it's yeah, it's, it is available actually in one shop. There are a few shops actually that well. There are, yeah, there are three shops that are actually selling the, the plants. And they send they sell these plants with these labels, and then you can, once you buy the plant, you actually can scan this label, and then you get all these details. Now, the, uh, the final, so my kind of mission and what I'm actually trying to build mm -hmm. now is a different system, so you could build it yourself. So if you have a, your own project, so you could build, a, you have this tool that I'm actually right now building, and so with that tool, you could build this kind of systems for yourself and handle all those QR codes and how you, like where they go and analytics for that is yeah, very important to, and it's kind of challenging if you have your own, if you want to build that on your own, it's a bit challenging because you need to include analytics, you need to build like all these landing pages. Well, yeah, because every bit... plan is different or every book is different and every page has exactly. to be according to a unique code on and every single one of the labels. So yeah, I'm trying to build this framework and this tool that people could use to build other products. And yeah, so that's the, that's the state of it at the moment. That's actually really cool because when you're saying building all these like tools and everything, the people using it, um, they don't know how it's being implemented and all that. And like that's you that you have to think how, like what technologies you use, especially exactly. as your software engineering background, you have to choose what technologies, you have to choose where you're hosting it, you have to, I guess, make decisions in terms of how do you market it as well. So it goes beyond of just the responsibility of building the tools because you have to put it in the shops that you, you're saying to begin exactly. with. Exactly. Well, this is a challenge. Like sales, This is why it's so interesting because... Sales is crazy. How does like, sales work is probably what everybody wants to know. So, so tricky. I could put some context for the people just listening to this that like this project was nothing. As in um, you had an idea. You, you didn't build anything. You didn't print anything. Um, it was basically just a blank canvas. So that was step zero. As uh, it evolved, I guess, 
um, you built the initial MVP. So going into the problem, you build like a smaller system that makes yeah. it work. It was very simple. Um, I mean, yeah. you could definitely <laughs> tell me more of what's going on with that. But I think just the bigger picture is that when you had nothing, you just built a simple system and you didn't manufacture like thousands of labels. You literally had one label yeah. and you use that as an example to do all yeah, of it. Yeah, we used that one MVP and we sold it to up to one shop and they were pretty interested in it. And then we went all the way, all way with that. And then we actually manufactured them in China and we built like 2,000 labels like that. And it, it was quite quite a challenge actually manufacturing that in China. So it was very interesting. And then, so you get all these sales from one side, it's very tricky to do. Then you get all this like marketing that you need to do to like a company. It's kind of like a companion for the sales. Like you cannot have basically sales without this marketing in my opinion mm -hmm. and then you get this mvp that you need to produce and then once you have your mvp you need to actually get to production and build that mvp but in a more like let's say it's going like a beta beta product and then so you produce that and then you have to like put it in the market and actually like sell it to other shops and start scaling up and once uh that, that's kind of where we are at the moment and Hopefully, we can actually move to the point where we can actually make a bigger order, get more more of these products, and yeah. yeah. And like this is this is all considering that like your background was and and software engineering. And now notice when you have all these other equations, marketing, all that, that's really just builds your role at the end of the day that you're not a software engineer anymore. You're an entrepreneur because it requires you to do all these different stuff. You do know at some point that you're gonna have to drop one of the other. You do know at some point you have to drop one. I have a big, a big, <laughs> you know, I have really a lot of troubles like <laughs> delegating tasks. And yeah. I, I tend to, I just want to do everything. And, I, and, that, and that's actually a big challenge to me. And But definitely, I think at some point, I probably will need to choose one of the or the other because you your time is very limited. Or neither, you know? <laughs> yeah, or neither. neither. I mean, that's uh, always there. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's always interesting because you could definitely see there's progress of looking forward to it, which is, I guess, if anybody has any idea, the path wouldn't be that dissimilar. You're start, going to start with nothing. You're going to start building one thing. You convince people with that one MVP and everything, which is amazing at the end of the day. If you have some, even your first users and they give you feedback, that's always so important because like your product that you're building is going to depend on that at the end. So um, if you guys don't know about it, go check it out. It's wisertag.com. Yeah. Uh, all the products is on there and I guess like just for the rest of this podcast I guess we've learned so much about it there's a lot of people that might want to go into that role so I guess going into the software engineering but also starting their own thing what kind of I guess general advice do you have for them so um, I think my, my general advice for anyone that is trying to like either like go if you if you want to go soft, software engineering I think that you definitely need to have some kind of technical background so I think it's very important to like learn the basics about programming and there are so many online resources to be honest and i think it's challenging at the beginning it's really challenging especially probably the first year or yeah probably well, you, getting your first job like, yeah, or getting right. your first job like it's really challenging challenging but once you get there i think it's just amazing it's like the, the greatest thing that we can have it's just an amazing skill to have i think being able to program and build your own products and automate tasks just this morning i was automating something and I was <laughs> I had this problem because I, I was I got like a weird like badly charge on TFL. TFL is the company that charges us for yeah for when you tr move in London, basically paying yeah. the tube and paying the underground. So I got this I wrote this small scraper algorithm that would actually like get me all the incomplete uh, journeys and. You know, basically, oh, just, just like, them, a, like get your refund. <laughs> yeah, so I can get my refund, right? Yeah, get that and money. <laughs> it's like literally, I they owe me like 170 pounds, but if if I want to go by like one by one manually, it's just like so challenging to do. And it's great to have a tool that I can just like code this algorithm, and in one hour, I actually do that whole thing automated, and it just does the whole refund for me. Wow. And that's actually really great. And it's one of the it's the kind of thing that you can do if you are a software software engineer. Um, then uh, on the other hand, like when you are building a product, that is actually another kind of set of skills. And I'm still kind of like a newbie on that side. Yeah. So probably I'm not the best to give examples. No, but your advice is just advice. as good as anybody who's tried it. So Yeah, well I tried and I think that I think it's very important to keep trying and building stuff you definitely learn a lot 
like when you are building your own product, your own company, like wh whatever it is, you are, you you will learn a lot. And I think learning is just like the, the the key thing that we have to do in life. It's just like keep learning, lifelong learner. That's great. That's great advice. Anybody who's got a project coming up, I mean, you're always going to mess up at some point, but you're always going to do something great to compensate for it. So learning and process, that's a really good thing for people listening. And I guess final bit, is there anything uh, people could follow you on? Any any social media or even yeah, just a so project? Tell us about that. Most social media I'm called is at Carlos Barraza. So it's difficult to like say. So it's B I'll link it. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. So if you put it on the description now. So basically I'm available on Twitter, I'm available on like whatever, Instagram. Yeah. Uh, probably my, my website is the simplest one. It's like carlosbarraza.com. And uh, then you can see follow everything. And of course, like Wiser Tag. We will be in Web Summit this year. So if you happen to be there, so just This year, 2019. <laughs> That's the year. That's pretty sick. Thanks again, Carlos, for being on the show. And uh, right. always, always happy to learn more, more from you and about you. Thank you, Perrine.